a student of pain. Pain is a big fat creature riding on your back. The farther you pedal, the heavier it feels. The harder you push, the tighter it squeezes your chest. The steeper the climb, the deeper it digs its jagged claws into your muscles. If there's any doubt that Lance Armstrong is indeed Payne's valedictorian, you need only look at the test results. While at the top of his game, he was nearly felled by the great equalizer, cancer. What's amazing is not that he beat the disease. That, to a certain extent, is a matter of faith. What's truly inspiring is that he came back, and that he came back even better than before. Stronger, smarter, faster, and more determined than ever to be a champion. is it exactly that makes Lance a champion? A better body? One of Lance's advantages is he started training hard and long, very young. A better bike? We came along and, and looked at every aspect of cycling, and not just the rider and the team, but every piece of equipment, all the way down to the, to the nuts and bolts. Well, there's Lance the athlete, who possesses the grit and raw determination to go out and inject every ounce of his being into the prospect of being a winner. Then there's Team Lance, a largely unsung group of behind-the-scenes heroes who exhibit the same dedication and commitment to making Lance a winner as Lance does. The talent pool from which Lance draws is many layers deep and represents some of the sharpest minds in technology, sports physiology, statistical analysis, and aerodynamics. The experts interact with each other like a Formula One development team, hence their name, the F1 Group. Much of the technology the F1 Group brings to racing is first tested in a wind tunnel, an environment originally designed to test aircraft components. What we're doing here today is testing members of the uh, Discovery Channel Pro Cycling Team. Uh, attempting to tweak their aerodynamic positions, attempting to improve some of their bike and equipment through measuring their aerodynamic drag. Oh, wow. Even what might seem like minor position changes, like an extended thumb or elbow or a slightly higher stance in the saddle, contribute significantly to wind drag. Yeah, better? better? Yeah. Okay, tunnel on. Okay, tunnel coming on. Go ahead and start pedaling. But in a race like the Tour de France, where a rider covers over 2,000 miles and spends almost 90 hours in the saddle, it can be the difference between winning and losing. Look at that screen up there. When, you, when it shows him from behind, he is absolutely rock solid. That's great. Can you go down, Caden, a little bit? 105, too high. Okay, Lance, nice change. job. Coast yeah. down at your comfort. We'll come in and make the change. Yeah. The, the road bike is 58, and this is only a half centimeter farther. It's got to be or it should be. Precious seconds are the currency that a professional bike rider trades in. And a few grams of weight or a slightly more aerodynamic component may mean going into a monster climb like the Col de Mont with a little more of that currency in the bank. We have a calculation that takes into consideration the, the grade of the hill you're climbing, the weight of the rider, the density of the air, the rolling resistance of the wheels. But look what happens when Lance goes to the drop. Watch the numbers come down. It's amazing. It's uh, like 40, your speed goes from about 40 to 40.7 kilometers an hour. That's huge. It's a lot. It's a huge difference. Yeah. And it's all, it was just all out there, just ready to be taken. So it's significant from there to, to here, when you're extended, is a pretty significant savings. And then two centimeters out. Lance takes an active role in assessing every detail. And then when you crouch yeah, on you the could, load, When you crash, you could huge yeah. you know, hear it. It's yeah. so big. Yes. And what's my <laughs> bag in here? I have to look. I have we to look at the We just had it. Your, your, your drag was 302.4 was the best. 
Armed with a giant propeller and a few million dollars worth of scientific equipment, on this day, Team Lance was able to make a great technical discovery. A series of minute changes in Lance's position on the bike would save one minute 36 seconds over the course of the time trial at the Tour de France. In fact, virtually everything is tested in the wind tunnel, from body position to the shirt on Lance's back. When we look at apparel as a piece of equipment, one of the interesting things in studying in the wind tunnel, we found that um, two-thirds of the drag comes off the body, whereas only a third comes off of the bike itself. We recognize a huge opportunity to help the athlete's body be as um, efficient as possible. Similar to the way a golf ball is designed, there's actually a texture on the golf ball, the dimples. And what the dimples do is they actually help the ball go farther and faster. The dimples create a sort of artificial uh, turbulent boundary layer um, increasing the surface friction of the ball itself. But the, the trade-off is that that flow as it wraps around the ball sticks to the ball a little bit better so that by the time it peels off the back of the ball, there's a much lower pressure drag coming off the back. We found that we could essentially apply the same principle to different parts of a cyclist's body. If Lance's sleeve were smooth, it would form a low pressure zone directly behind his arm, creating drag. Applying a dimpled texture to the surface, just like on a golf ball, shrinks the trailing low pressure zone. This reduces aerodynamic drag and allows him to go faster. We found that certain objects of, of certain sizes, they need to be in a textured finish. You know, cylinders that are about the size of biceps, about the size of a lower quadricep. Um, so we definitely don't want to put uh, just simply a smooth surface over the entire body and we don't want to put a rough surface over the entire body. We really want to mix it up a little bit and make sure we get every surface of the body tuned with just the appropriate texture. The air is going to flow over Lance's back here and then at a certain point it's going to separate. So we actually reduce this uh, back seam to lower so that the air is going to flow across and then lift off before it hits that seam. Averaging about 150 grams better than standard issue um, bib short and jersey, which in a 190 kilometer stage, uh, that's looking like somewhere between three to four minutes worth of time. To prepare for the Tour de France in July, Lance begins training in November. He'll ride an average of 450 miles per week over eight months. That's over halfway around the globe. Painstaking training. Will it add up to a win? Look at me, I'm gonna be out here six hours. I've been doing this for 14 years, I still love it. the finish line? Well, you can. Just be sure to log on to teamdiscoverychannel.com and come back the same time tomorrow for another Chasing Number 7. Lance Armstrong is a winner, but even with all the training, he is never a sure to win. What is it? A bird? A, it hurts. There are always variables. Blink a bunch. It's a big, nasty black oh. bug. Is it that big? Did you see it? It's a big black yeah. bug, yeah. You probably got it. Feeling better now? Screw the science. There it is. Planet. Right there. It? Still alive. <laughs> Just putting my glasses on, too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> God. That thing was killing me. So it just shows you what, like, you know, one gram bug, you know, an ounce bug can do. Yeah, I know. Bring a man down. Yeah. There can be no mistakes. There can be uh, no X factor, meaning um, he can't get sick, he can't have a crash, he can't have anything that he loses a week of training. Every single day is critical. What most people don't realize is that cycling is not an individual sport. Basically, cycling is, is a marathon combined with chess, combined with NASCAR. Lance Armstrong can no more win a stage race alone than a quarterback can win a Super Bowl by himself. Jim Okowitz is former director sportif of Lance's Motorola team. Each of the other riders on the team have a specific job to do, and those jobs are very clear 
and they don't deviate. Lance is the leader of the team. Then there are people that you call lieutenants, people that can make it the furthest in the race each day. He would be the last rider to give Lance some shelter in the draft on the last mountain of the day. He would not use Lance in the race until that moment because he needs to be good in the final moment when the real race for victory happens. And then you have other people that are called domestiques. Food, water bottles, whatever Lance needs during the day, they go back to the cars, they pick up rain jackets, they bring it back through. Anybody else wanted something? I didn't hear anything. Ask again. I need some water. Those are your three primary positions. And then at the end, you see Lance and the other quarterbacks come up and they start to race against each other. And that's the real drama in professional cycling when those 12 or 20 survivors are up front and they're and they're and they're just they're just doing everything they can to win that race that day. At the end of a pro race, the guy who wins the sprint isn't the guy with the most speed. It's the guy who's not tired. Much like football, the main function of Lance's teammates is blocking. But instead of blocking the opposite team's defense, they're blocking the wind. This technique is called drafting. The ideal position in a group for the team leader is in the third or fourth position, where he'll only need to expend 75% of the effort of the first rider. When you consider that wind tunnel tests have shown that 80% of a rider's energy is spent cutting through the air, you can see just how crucial drafting really is. Drafting directly behind a teammate is effective if the team is riding directly into the wind. But what happens if the wind is coming from the side? In this case, they have to make an adjustment. So they ride in a wing formation called an echelon. A group of six to 10 riders could probably go over five miles farther in an hour than an individual. Each rider will rotate through for maybe two or 300 meters where you're sprinting at the front. The riders behind are resting and they'll, they'll all be sharing the work. Of utmost concern to the team is making sure their leader is rested enough to fend off an attack by a competing rider in the final stages of a race. The idea is to be with riders that you can out sprint at the end. Or if you're a really strong rider, if you can narrow your competition down so that you don't have all the sprinters still with you. The thing I've always enjoyed the most about cycling is that the strongest rider doesn't always win. It's generally the smartest rider. This battle of the team leaders is where the rubber meets the road. It's where the metal of a cyclist is tested and true champions emerge. Eddie Merckx, Bernard Hinault, Miguel Indurain, and now, of course, Lance Armstrong. These are the heroes of the great sport of cycling. Lance may be the Discovery Team leader, but this man is the Discovery Team mastermind. Johan Brunel is probably one of the smartest guys, the cleverest tacticians that ever rode the tour. Johan Brunel, director sportif of Lance Armstrong's Discovery Channel Pro Cycling Team, boasts his own record. A career high point was setting a record for the fastest stage in tour history. He now dictates tactics and strategy to the team via radio. Lance Armstrong, having seen these conditions go from absolutely miserable to abysmal, some of the worst of the year so far, and so much rain has fallen, it's making the communication very tough between the team directors and the riders. Well, he's giving him a new earpiece there, Bob, but how on earth do you put it on it in conditions like this? I know, you put it on it. I know, I know, I know. What do I look like, Houdini or something? <laughs> in fact, Lance and Johan even raced against each other in 1995. It's these former competitors that have become not only friends, but accomplices. Very good, Lance, very good. Come on, come on, come on, very good, looking good. With riders from 15 countries on the Discovery Squad, the fact that Johan speaks six languages fluently proves an invaluable communication aid. No there's a lot of information coming into the car which tells us who's ahead, how many seconds the breakaway has. I think he's the best in the business. We were linked up 
you know, six, six years ago for, for absolutely no reason. It's just one of those times in history when somebody comes along in your life and, and makes a huge difference. Motivator and mastermind, Johan Brunil is without a doubt one of the all-time great directors in the sport of cycling. But long before Johan, Lance had another director sportif that was a little closer to home. When he was 10 years old, he was running in 10Ks. And not only just showing up for the race on Saturdays, but during the week, he was running and training. I would map out a 6.2 mile course for him, and he would train during the week on that course. He started doing triathlons and was competing when he was 14 years old in triathlons. I got a call in 1985 from Lance's mother saying her son's a triathlete and she was looking for sponsorship. And I was just trying to be polite. I was thinking, oh, give me a break, lady. And I asked, well, what kind of results has he had? And she told me what his results were. And I realized that he was better on the bike. He was ahead of all the gods of triathlon, all the best guys. And he was 14. And I wanted him riding our parts. The first time I ever talked to Lance on the phone after I talked to his mom, as 14-year-old triathlete, was probably the most arrogant, obnoxious 14-year-old I ever talked to in my life. And I thought, well, he's really talented. Uh, I think we'll sponsor him anyway and just take a chance. I would say confident, and people, other people would call it cocky. Um, but I say that's what gives him the confidence to win. He wound up being the youngest world champion on the road ever at the age of 21. One of Lance's advantages is he started training hard and long, very young. He became a very good triathlete uh, in his early teen years. There's almost certainly a genetic component that he had the capability of developing a heart that has a above average large volume and has the muscular strength and the capability to empty that heart chamber with each beat. What is it about Lance's heart that makes Lance better than anyone else? Lance's heart can pump an astonishing nine gallons of blood per minute at its maximum output, while the average heart can only pump five. During that same minute, his heart will beat over 200 times. That makes it a third more effective than an average man's. If you put him in a ring with someone else, he'd be the last guy standing. And his approach to winning was, just get me out there, and I'll outslug whoever it is. He didn't race necessarily to win. He just raced to make people suffer, to show how much stronger he was. And he raced to decimate people and to win by as much as he could. He was national champion, he was world champion. He'd even won stages in the tour. Lance was untouchable. I think everyone world round would have uh, said that his chances of surviving the illness were in the 30 to 40 percent range. He was a uh, world-class athlete, uh, used to having lumps and bumps and pains around his body, and particularly in uh, the area on the saddle. He probably uh, undoubtedly attributed uh, the pain and swelling in that area to uh, some injury he had suffered on the bike. One night, I got a call at dinner with the kids, and my wife were sitting there, and and uh, pick up the phone, it's Lance. He says, hey, Oach, what are you doing? I said, I'm sitting here at the table eating dinner. He said, you sitting down? I said, yeah, I'm sitting down. What's, what's, what, do you, what do you need? I mean, Lance called me. I was at work. It was 10 o'clock at night, and he told me he'd been diagnosed with cancer. That evening, the phone rings, and I hear Lance's neighbor on the other end, and he said, Linda, I don't know any easy way to tell you this but Lance has been diagnosed with cancer. And I asked him to repeat what he just said. I could not believe what I was hearing on the other end of the line. And he repeated it and it literally <laughs> crushed every single piece of me on the inside. 
This is the CT scan from when he presented uh, in 1996. As you can see, these large, whitish areas throughout his lung represent areas where the testicular cancer had deposited and grown. Uh, this should all be black. I'm not even sure he knew what he had. I, knew, I think he knew he had, obviously he knew he had cancer, but he didn't know the extent that he had cancer. And this is uh, a brain CT scan, and here is one of the areas of deposits that was, uh, again, found its way to his brain and uh, uh, actually it had to be removed surgically. The impact of his treatments were in the short term debilitating, devastating, nutritionally depleting, and in every fashion, he was beaten down by the treatments and the disease. Had uh, you asked me to bet on his chances of, A, surviving his disease, B, uh, maintaining any athleticism after his treatment, uh, or C, win any Tour de France's, I obviously would have uh, not taken any of those bets. Uh, because the odds were against him in, on every one of those scores. And first thing he said, very first thing he said, hey, Ouch, I'm, I'm going to beat this thing. The first cancer treatment option for Lance Armstrong included bleomycin, chemotherapy capable of permanently scarring his lungs. Another new treatment called iphosphamide would be more painful and debilitating in the short term, but would spare his lungs and allow him to return to the saddle. Never did I doubt, never. I, I just, the fear of losing my only child, never did I entertain the thought that, that I would lose him. I, I, I think of several low points, but, but really the reality of that low point was when Lance came downstairs after he'd already had one round of chemotherapy, found out he had two, tum two tumors in his brain and was going to have brain surgery shortly thereafter. And just before then, he comes downstairs, he sits down for breakfast, he's got a ball cap on, and he takes off his cap and he says, Mom, my hair is falling out. It's hard. Perhaps drawing on his intense desire to win, Lance chose to attack the disease with the same effort and determination that he brought to cycling. I think his uh, physiology definitely allowed him to tolerate the chemotherapy better than the average person. His experience with pain and suffering uh, allowed him uh, to uh, emotionally and physically get through the treatments better than the average person. Uh, the fact that he was nutritionally and physically fit uh, gave him the reserves to uh, tolerate the treatment better than uh, certainly you or I. I. I know exactly what I believe that gets him up those mountains, and those are uh, long mountains, and those descents are hard and, and tough, and, and just getting through those crowds. I, I really believe that all he has to do is go back to that day that he was laying in that bed when he was so sick that he couldn't even talk on the phone or raise his head. That's what gets him up and down those mountains. It is an absolute tribute uh, to his strength, his will, his focus, and his desire to uh, be better after cancer than before uh, that allowed him to achieve what he has achieved. And uh, it remains an absolute really stellar example of what people can do after cancer. Lance Armstrong was no longer a cancer patient. He was a cancer survivor. But as wretched as the disease was, it taught him something invaluable. I just wasn't as hungry as I should have been as an athlete before the illness. And so it, it, I think it was this opportunity to, to, to really have, it's a cliche, but to really have a wake up call. I mean, I woke up and just thought, man, this is my life. This is, I really think this is the only shot I, got, I have at it. And just go for it. So when Lance got cancer 
and he came back from that. He rebuilt his body 20 pounds lighter with the same power as a cyclist. So what he did was he, he, he took a guy who was a world professional champion and had won stages in the tour, and you improved his power to weight ratio by 10%. Usually, you know, races are won by a half a percent, by one percent. To have a 10% prove, improvement is just so astronomical that you can't imagine. Lance began to pay particular attention to his own physiology, using a battery of very specific tests to improve his performance. Metabolic profiling with lactate testing is used to assess the capability of probably 80, maybe even higher percent of the elite pro cyclists now. It's three different measures of his performance capability. Heart rate, lactate, oxygen uptake. All of them critical to performance. All of them things that uh, there would be a lot of focus on Lance tra Lance's training program with. Monitoring performance is all about increasing power output. Everyone has limits of performance, but knowing and training around those limits allows an elite athlete like Lance to generate the maximum amount of power in the heat of battle. A key benchmark for measuring lung efficiency is the VO2 max test. VO2 max is your best measure of aerobic capacity, your ability to do work. This is a set of one-way valves, so all the air comes in this side, goes into his lungs, and then out this side. So we capture all the expired air on this side, and then in the device, we're measuring six critical variables in that air, but most importantly, we're measuring the difference in the oxygen content of the air that comes in this side and what comes out that side. For every breath Lance pulls into his lungs, he extracts far more oxygen than the average person. An impressive 83 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight. And he generates over 500 watts of power at his peak performance. In contrast, the average healthy 20-year-old extracts a mere 45 milliliters of oxygen and generates only 250 watts of power. In other words, we all take in the same breath. Lance just uses his twice as efficiently. When we did his metabolic capacity and I could see the amount of power that he could put out um, in watts and his oxygen uptake, those were exceptional. They were among the very highest that we had tested. So Jim, we're going to start you at 125 watts here for four minutes, all right? At increasing levels of intensity, like those that occur during a climb of the Pyrenees, muscles create lactic acid, which accounts for the punishing burn associated with great levels of exertion. At the end of this four minutes, I'm going to do a blood draw, just a little bit off the tip of your finger, um, and I'm going to test that for lactate. As the test goes on, we'll start to see that lactate just build up in his blood. And at some point, for any athlete, whether a beginner or Lance Armstrong, that lactate will build up to the point where it forces the body to stop. Just simply can't go on any farther. Can you do another stage, Jim? Okay, we're okay. going to take you through. Hang on. This is like the end of an endless climb. Nice, Jim. All right. Nice. Very good. Very good. For reasons unknown to science, Lance's muscles produce less lactic acid than everyone else's. What's more, his body eliminates that lactic acid more efficiently. These two unique advantages mean that when he exceeds his aerobic capacity during periods of intense power output, like on a sprint for the finish, Lance maintains full power longer. What else can Lance do better than his competitors? At high altitude, cyclists use training and recovery to increase their oxygen carrying capacity. Lance Armstrong metabolizes oxygen better than most. And Lance doesn't appear to have much of a drop in his oxygen uptake capability as he climbs higher and higher and higher. If you think in something like the tour, there are many very decisive stages that are contested at those elevations of 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 meters. And if he doesn't lose that metabolic capability, that certainly would contribute significantly to uh, being able to be successful. When there's less oxygen available to the lungs, the body creates more red blood cells. More red blood cells increase a rider's ability to use oxygen, bringing more of it into his system when he needs it most. 
Some people in the cycling world have looked at Lance's phenomenal success in the Tour de France and have accused him of artificially increasing his red blood cell levels. But Lance says his critics have it all wrong. So many people want to want to look, look high and low for, for something naughty, but, you know, something naughty would, be, I think, in my opinion, would make a small difference, whereas looking at the minutia of every little aspect of cycling adds up to a major difference. It adds up to five or six minutes. There's no, there's no way to, to skirt controls or, or, or to, we've been around too long and I have too much pressure on us to, to try to take any risks. Lance's unprecedented dominance has made him one of the most drug-tested athletes on the planet, and he has not once failed the test. But with all the training, all the performance testing, all the long rides at altitude, there's one thing a cyclist can't avoid. Elite athletes are very unique individuals of how they deal with pain. These are sensations from my body telling me how hard I'm working. This is a wonderful sensation. You know, it's, it's part of the job, so you have to suffer in training, you have to suffer in the races. You know, of course, that, that type of suffering changes throughout the year, both in training and racing. You know, if you, you, asked, you talked about the, the early season camp in California, I mean, uh, that's, that's pure, 100% miserable suffering. But, you know, here we are, and just before the tour, and, and, and I go out on a, a long chain ride or do some hard testing, race simulation, are in the races, and it doesn't feel at all like it did in January, so that's the type of suffering that we, or I tend to enjoy. While Lance was pushing his body to new extremes, his technology team was inspired to keep up the pace. That could have been better. That could be a nice year for well, there. When we won the first tour in 1999, we basically won it with, um, I don't want to say inferior equipment, but we did not pay attention to much detail. We didn't have a lot of that stuff at our fingertips. And every year after that, we started to change things and became known as these guys that were just possessed and obsessed with technology. We don't deliver custom frames to the Discovery team. They ride off-the-shelf frames. So uh, we're constantly looking for new things to improve ride quality and ride feel. The most significant revolution came with the use of carbon fiber in frames and wheels, which was borrowed from the aerospace industry. This is carbon fiber. It's multiple plies of carbon fiber laid down in a sheet that then we cut with a special knife system that's on the CNC cutting table. Carbon fiber is made by charring synthetic fibers to increase their strength. We would never want to make all of the pieces parts all the same thickness. The bike would be way too heavy. So what we are doing is we are structurally reinforcing only those areas that need it and so therefore lightening the bike up and yet maintaining performance. This is a 2005 Madan frame and it weighs about the same as a paperback book. Since we have all the latest tools and technology, there's no making a mistake when we're developing product for Lance. Lance is very well known for being able to pick up millimeters of, of change. How's that feel? Too bike? short. Two centimeters too short. And we have tools to be able to make sure that we get everything in the right place. Using software and hardware, we've created virtual prototypes that we're able to analyze and to virtually weigh, virtually optimize, and virtually visualize way before we made anything. So the only thing we can't do right now is virtually get on the bike and ride, which we're working on. One of the things that we were able to do with the Madone that we hadn't in the past was use some new technology and that technology was computational fluid dynamics, or CFD. With a partnership with AMD to get us faster computers, we were able then to run the Madone parts in a virtual wind tunnel. We were able to see a couple of things. One is the actual air flow around an object. We can actually check the aerodynamics of a bike without having to spend time in a wind tunnel. It also shows in the colors high pressure and low pressure areas. We can try changing the shape, changing the position. And then when we finally come up with a final design, we can go to the wind tunnel and verify those results. One of the two things that Lance is always demanding, one thing is lightness or lightweight, and the other thing is stiffness. Lightness because it's less weight to haul up the mountains. And stiffness because it allows more pedal power to be transferred to the road. 
we have a benchmark of what Lance likes, and then we can create a frame that is either more or less stiff, depending on what Lance is looking for. But the F1 group doesn't stop with the bike. Every piece of equipment is examined and re-examined. Pretty much the fastest helmet on this planet right now, and there's only one of them, and Lance gets it. Uh, primarily, you know, we want to keep the riders as safe as possible, but secondary is we want to have the fastest helmets in the world. Our goal was to minimize that drag as much as possible. And the time savings with this particular helmet versus the older style time trial helmet was almost 23 seconds. Big savings. Technological advancements can be found from head to toe. This is one of the biggest innovations over the past five years, six years. This is a nylon plate. This is a carbon fiber plate, basically a material difference. But what it allows us to do is really lighten this up. These carbon fiber shoes are almost 10% lighter than their nylon predecessors. The cycling shoe has a really hard bottom on it. Um, it's about energy transfer. So any power you put into the pedals through your legs goes through this plate. Lance really likes a shoe that's very, very stiff. So this plate is made out of carbon fiber. This will withstand like 12, 1500 pounds of force before it'll bend at all. The Discovery Team's European base is in Brackel, Belgium, 30 miles west of Brussels. Julian de Vries has been a bike mechanic for over 40 years. He has a unique way of caring for the team's tubular tires. He ages them in his private cellar. Okay, gentlemen, now we are in a place, one of the most important things from the team. We are in the, where the, all the tubulars are stuck. It's very important that the tubular is old and softer for the, the flat tires. While the tubular who is young, uh, that's glued and the glue is not dry. Feel here, an old tubular is supple, a young one is harder. And that's the difference. There are the tubulars from 2004. These are tubulars from 2003. Paris-Roubaix tubulars are stocked for next year. And under, we have the classic tubulars. So that's Lance Armstrong's corner. Look, this tubular for Lance, for the Tour de France, is going to be more than six, seven years old. That's like a wine basement. You use all the wine also like this, and I use my tubulars like this. Beginning July 2nd, Lance will race down the roads of France for the last time, riding on tires aged like wine and gunning to sip champagne for the seventh year in a row. Unfortunately for race fans everywhere, the 2005 Tour will be the end of an era. The Tour de France will be my last race as a professional cyclist. For three weeks in July, Lance and 188 riders will race over the beautiful yet punishing roads of France. The technical aspect of being able to race in a Tour de France is only comparable to something like Formula One or, or, or real high-end IndyCar type racing in a car where you're at high speeds and you're two inches off somebody's bumper and, you're, and you're at, you're, you've, you've got it going as fast as it can go. And you have to trust that person in front of you and you've got to trust the person behind you the whole time. And so you're, all, you're constantly on the edge. Anything can happen any moment, any time, any day, any week any time during those races. The tour route changes every year. This time, riders will tackle 2,200 miles over 21 stages, with only two rest days. For Lance to win seven in a row, he must conquer these three key stages. Right from the beginning, stage one foreshadows the grit the riders will have to exhibit merely to finish. An individual time trial along the blustery French coast, an all-out sprint against the clock. This is a time trial bike, and it's raced one at a time against the clock over a certain course. The position is a little bit different, and the equipment on the bike is a little bit different. The reason this bike has the shapes that it does, the, the shaped wheels and the, the shapes on the tubes and the shape of the handlebar, is because you're racing this bike against the wind. The aerodynamics become the most important part of why this bike is shaped the way that it is. Time trialing has always been one of Lance's specialties, but even one mistake and he can find himself way behind a mere 12 miles into the race. When Lance reaches the mountains, he'll ride a different bike. Although aerodynamics are always important, weight becomes the focus here. 
This is what the team calls their climbing bike. This bike is meant to be as light as possible. It's about 100 grams lighter than the Madone frame. And 100 grams uh, in this particular application is about 10%. We're counting every gram when those guys go uphill. 100 grams is 100 paper clips. 100 grams is a lot. The second key stage is stage number 10, between Grenoble and Courcheval in the Alps, where Lance will first break out his climbing bike. After scaling the majestic Cormé de Rosalan with the aid of his lieutenants, Lance will still have nearly 14 more miles of climbing ahead of him. Going from 6 to 8 to almost 10% gradient, this stage will begin to separate the contenders from the rest of the pack. Stage 15 in the Pyrenees is the third key stage and ranks as one of the toughest tour stages ever. It covers 127 miles and six major categorized climbs and could very well determine who wins the tour. Lance and his teammates cannot afford a bad day with the finish line in Paris, only a week away. These mountains hold a special importance to Lance. It was during the 1995 tour on a descent of the Col de Porte d'Espée that his teammate Fabio Casertelli crashed to his death. In memory of his good friend, Lance won the stage into Limoges two days later, and again in 2001. With two fingers pointed at the heavens, he signified to Fabio that this win was for him. When Lance talks about the stage into Limoges, he says he felt no pain, no suffering. It was as if he had the strength of two men, himself and Fabio. This year, Lance will need that strength again if he wants to take another victory ride down the Champs-Élysées. When you get to ride in there uh, six times in a row with, with the yellow jersey and, and then stand on the top step and hear your national anthem, it's awesome. I can't imagine, I can't imagine riding in the second or third. I don't want to know what that's like. Guys race, prepare, train, organize their teams completely different after Lance and before Lance. He's changed the sport to bring in more technology, more determination, more precise training, and people when they say, I want to be a great athlete, now they have the benchmark in my mind of the most complete athlete from preparation to execution to just every extra ounce of his being going into it we've ever seen. Hey man. I know what I'm doing. I mean, I've got the experience, I've got the, uh, the desire, and I've got the team, so, you know. The Tour de France represents a commitment toward a cause that's difficult for some people to comprehend. But what they might not consider is that it's a cause greater than the individual rider's pain. It's a chance for a man to distinguish himself on a unique battlefield. In 1903, the founder of the Tour de France made a public statement that sums up the Tour's allure to an athlete. He said, entire populations will present themselves before you. Their hands raised in applause, their eyes wide open to catch a lasting memory of the battle. Lance Armstrong has distinguished himself as a hero on this very special battlefield. Will he win a seventh Tour? Whatever the result for Lance, a man who has conquered this grueling event six times after having conquered cancer, victory surely comes not in crossing the finish line, but in crossing the starting line. Because for as long as men race bikes, people will not be able to mention this great race without mentioning the great Lance Armstrong.